introduce our speaker for today, Brother Skylar Smith. Um, for those who don't know, he is uh, Chipley, Grace Chipley's youth pastor, and uh, him and his wife Megan, they do incredible work for the kids. It's, it's, it's an honor to have him here today, so if uh, everyone would, we'd give him, like to give him a warm welcome. <laughs> How are you guys this morning? Good. Good. I think it's been, what, a year since I've been here last? It's been a while. Uh, I was super excited when the pastor asked me to come back and preach. I was like, yes. I loved preaching over in Vernon. Uh, they're very nice to me. I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, as I'm sitting there listening, that's a long list of prayers. Amen. Um, and man, it just reminds me that like, while we're still here, there's still a lot of work to do. And, the, and his word says that uh, my house is a house of prayer. And the prayer has been something that we've been focusing on. You know, I was talking with Brother Rick about it. And like, uh, a pastor made and just ran mega sports camp. And, you know, this is the first year that I heard that uh, it didn't rain any of the nights. And Megan and I, at the beginning of the week, we were specifically praying, like, Lord, don't let it, don't let it rain. And he closed up the skies. And we were just like, yes, prayer does work. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a simple thing like that, but like when God answers simple prayers, like He can answer these hard ones as well. Amen. Amen. Like He's faithful in the little, and He's going to be faithful in the big. Amen. And so, and also, I'm hearing all these numbers of like people who need salvation. Uh, this past, I want to say two, three months, you know, we took our youth and our kids over to youth camp and kids camp, and. One of the things that we, we looked over was the numbers of the generation who actually followed Jesus, or at least they claimed to, right? And so the thing that stands out the most to me is the numbers go down and down per generation. So my generation, which is millennials, I think we're at 14% that actually claim to be Christian. Or, no, no, there's a higher percentage that claims to be Christian, 14% that actually live a biblical Christian life. And so when you go to the next generation, it goes down dramatically to about 2 to 4%. Mm, mercy. And so I'm like, God, where's the fall off? What is going on? Because there's people in church, but something's not translating over. And so, you know, I'm really big on discipleship. And that's something that uh, brother Rick and I were talking about and when he was talking about you guys you guys are hungry to disciple you guys are hungry to get out there uh, specifically this church over in Vernon and so it reminded me of a talk that pastor Ben Pittman and I had years ago anybody know brother Ben Pittman he's the Australian guy it's easy to remember him <laughs> and so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk today about the three people you need in your Christian and so, starting with me, for 19 years, I was just like every other person in my generation that I believed I was a Christian. I went to church. I, you know, was taught that if you just believe in Jesus, then you're good, right? You can claim that you're a Jesus follower and good. And so far to the point to where if anybody ever tried to tell me I wasn't, we would almost be throwing hands. <laughs> and I, uh, as I was coming here today, God reminded me that I had this shirt that uh, it had a finger on it like this, and it said, you need Jesus. And I was like, I used to wear that shirt with pride. And then he was like, yeah, do you remember when you point this way, three fingers are actually pointing back at you. Mm -hmm. So I was really speaking to you that whole time. Right. And you thought you were clever. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and so I went to church every once in a while with my friends group growing up. Um, and I did things that made me appear to know God. So like if I was at school and somebody like, Oh, who believes in God? I'm like, I do. And they're like, what? Dude, you cuss more than anybody here. Like, you're into all the stupid stuff that everybody does. And I'm like, well, I go to church, and uh, the people over at Great, uh, not Grace, but Callaway Assembly, they'll tell you that I'm there once a month. <laughs> <laughs> and during this period of time, nothing can convince me I wasn't saved or a Christian. And reflecting on this period, it actually made me think of Paul. You see, Paul... Paul was uh, a Jew, and he was from a devout Jewish family. He was also born 
born. Oh my goodness, I can't talk. He was also born as a Roman citizen in the city of Tarsus. So if you don't know the history of Paul, his, before Paul, it's Saul. He it didn't change his name, but the Roman name and the uh, Jewish name flipped. So his name was Saul of Tarsus. He grew up in Jerusalem and was brought up by Gamaliel, a leading authority in the Jewish religious establishment known as the Sanhedrin. The way I explain that to the youth is like, that's their Supreme Court. Like, whenever they have problems, they bring it up to the Sanhedrin. In addition to learning religious scriptures, he also studied Greek philosophers and was well acquainted with the Stoic philosophers, who advocated a virtuous acceptance of life as a path to happiness. In his daily life, he was a tent maker. See, during his early life, Paul was a Pharisee. I'm sure we've all heard that name before, the Pharisee. You're being a Pharisee. Uh, we kind of relate them with, like, legalistic people who, like, add on too many laws or things like that. Uh, I've been called that before, and it's just following Scripture. But I think that's the big problem with today's society and the Christians today is if you lay down the foundation and they don't agree with it, your labor of Pharisee. And so this included taking part of stoning Stephen. He was so much into the Pharisee thing that they were persecuting the followers of the way at that time. Because Christians didn't exist, they called themselves the followers of the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And so he was present. And I could just imagine him saying, yes, throw another stone as Stephen's being hit with these rocks. And one reason Paul was so critical of the new sect which followed Jesus was the fact that he was so appalled that Jesus died a criminal's death on the cross. He couldn't imagine that the Messiah would die a criminal's death. And so this man who grew up in the Jewish culture, he knew all of the Old Testament, and he grew up wanting to basically do what I'm doing, preach the word of God. They didn't have the New Testament, of course, because he wrote most of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's me, who didn't know a lick of scripture. So it's like, how do those two connect? Well, it both connected with us because we both thought that we knew God and that we were doing what he wanted. Paul was convinced that he was doing everything that a man of God was supposed to do. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and prayed with the other Jews. He rose up in a Jewish family. I grew up in a Christian family. And so... We both were looking around and listening to what was being taught to us. You see, and this brings me to the main verse of the day that I want to talk about. If you can bring that up for me. And this is it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. It says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I like the way it says it in the New Living Translation. It says, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. You see, Paul was great at imitating the leaders in his life. He wanted to follow their example and do what was right in the eyes of God. That it led him to persecuting Christians because he believed that they had blasphemed the Lord. And his mind, the way that he had grown up and what he had heard people teach him, he was doing it the right way. When Christians heard the name Saul Tarsus, it actually struck a lot of fear in him. You see, in, in my life, when people would ask me if I was Christian and saved and things like that, I thought I was doing it the right way. I was watching the people before me, and the way that they lived life as a Christian, I imitated it. You see, my mom had this thing that we had the Ten Commandments on the wall. And the way that she would use them was, oh, you're being disobedient. What is uh, honor that mind of thy father? And that's the only time I really ever heard scripture. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was like, oh, great, here we go. So, like, I became that person that I used scripture when it was convenient for me to correct someone else. <clears throat> You see, and if you'll turn with me in your Bibles over to Acts chapter 9, we're going to read through verses 1 and 9.
And I'm reading out of the New International Version, so. says this, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to, to synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as a prisoner to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. He was You know, and I just want to make this point here. This has nothing to do with sermon. It's just an observation. When Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I want you to recognize he doesn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He doesn't say, why are you killing off my people? He says, why are you persecuting me? And just as a word of encouragement, when you're doing the Lord's work, remember, they're attacking him and not you. You see, and as we can see in these beginning verses, Paul became the main force against Christians. He stood behind and watched people persecute him, and then he said, you know what? I'm even going to take this to the next level because I really want to do something for God, and I want to take out these people. You see, and they were known as followers of the way, as we talked about earlier. He was on his way to bring back more followers, but then Jesus shows up. He blinds Paul, and he asks him, why are you persecuting? The rest of the chapter goes on to explain that Paul is blind and led to a man named Judas who lives on Straight Street. While Paul is there, Jesus speaks to a man named Ananias to go and heal his eyes. Ananias is rightly afraid of Paul, but he does what Jesus had told him to do. Paul's sight is restored, and after a few days spent with the disciples in Damascus, Paul started preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. If you'll look down at verse 21 with I want us to take a closer look at this verse. Paul goes out. He's been dramatically changed by Jesus. He gets his sight back. And he goes out and he starts preaching, Jesus is the Son of God. And this is what happens when he does that. It says, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on the name of Jesus? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Paul had a reputation when he started to preach Jesus. And so when he came out, they probably thought he had an underlying agenda. Like, oh, we know what you're doing. You're trying to act like you're with us, and you're going to sneak us out of here. We see you. We know what's going on, Paul. He later tried to meet up with the apostles in Jerusalem, but they were scared to meet with him. So Peter, John, and all of them were like, no, nah, we know him. He's wanting to come meet us. Nope. Get him out of here. Uh, we got Jesus' work to do. I know he said that we'll be protected for a little while, but we ain't trying to be taken out right now. So this version of Paul may relate to some of us in the room, where you've had a reputation. And so... When you first came, I know for me personally, I had a reputation to the people in my city. And so when they saw that I was actually trying to live for Jesus, they didn't believe it. Yeah, we've heard this story before. We know what you're underlying trying to do. <clears throat> and as he goes and meet, to meet the apostles, if you'll go down to verse 27, I want to introduce the first person I want to talk about that needs to be in your life. It says, But Barnabas 
took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul in his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. This man Barnabas, his real name was Joseph, but he got the nickname Barnabas from the apostles, because, and he was well trusted. The name Barnabas means son of encouragement. Paul was starting out his preaching journey and needed some backing, and Barnabas was the man for the job. Um, I got this uh, as I was searching Barnabas, Saul, and uh, Timothy, which is going to be our three people that we need in our life today. I, I, I took this article from this man because he puts it so well, in, well, well written. I cannot speak today. <laughs> the water. So the first person you need is a Barnabas, and this is a well-described person. A Barnabas is someone who encourages you and holds you accountable in your faith and your life. This is a more or less a mutual friendship, or what's called in the world of spiritual formation, a spiritual friendship. In the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas traveled together side by side. Barnabas was a key person in Paul's life, especially at the beginning, as we just read. Their relationship then became one of mutual encouragement, ministry, and accountability. Without Barnabas coming in and vouching for Paul, who knows if we even have the majority of the New Testament. I know that in my life, I've had to have someone vouch for me. I brought up Pastor Ben earlier. Um, I was... 1920, whenever Pastor Ben first started pouring into me. And he had heard my reputation before because I was at the church beforehand and um, I don't like to tell this story a lot because it kind of still stings. I was dating a girl and we had already been going to the church and we had broken up. And that morning, I can, I can remember it, she told me she was going to come by and pick me up for church. And I was just right down the road and she never showed up. So I walked in the rain, and when I got to the church, I found her I'm soaking wet. And she starts going off on me, why are you here, leave me alone, and all this other stuff. And I was a confused 18, 19 year old boy. And I remember just trying to follow her and talk to her. And the security came up and was like, what's going on? And her mom came running out and said, this boy has been stalking my daughter. He's a creep, get him out of here. And Pastor Ben's wife, Pastor Brooke, was right there whenever I got called that. So Pastor Ben knew what I had been called and what he heard about me. See, the possible apostles knew what they had heard about Paul. And Pastor Ben didn't give up on me. He came and he, and he brought me and he taught me the word. And then he vouched for me as time kept going on. He and I can now talk about things as partners in ministry. But the word I want to focus on is now we can talk about this stuff. See, before he was my Barnabas, I needed to learn under him and imitate the way he lived for Jesus. So going back, that brings us back to the second person you need. And you need this person before you need a Barnabas in most cases. And that is, you need a Paul. And we're not talking about the Paul before he got converted in the beginning. We're talking about the one that wrote majority of the New Testament and laid down his life for the gospel and changed the way everything he was about. You see, Paul represents the person in your life who mentors, leads, and directs you. This is a person who comes alongside you to disciple you along the road of faith and life. This is someone who has traveled further down the road of life and faith than you have. This man or woman doesn't have to be a great deal older than you. Pastor Ben is not that much older than me. He's got me maybe by like seven years. But his spiritual maturity is, is astounding to me. I wouldn't be where I am now here preaching to you without him coming in and being my Paul at one point in my life.
It's usually the case, but this man or woman doesn't have to be older than you. You know, it's funny because I had written this sermon at the beginning of this week, and something happened, um, I want to say Thursday. I think that's the day. So it kind of works out perfectly with this. I, I was at the church over in Chipley, and I was, um, you know, trying to work on stuff coming up for this Sunday, and the internet went out. And normally what happens is I wait for the internet to come back and um, I can get back to work. And if it doesn't come back, I usually, you know, pack up and I go home. Well, for some reason this day, I decided I'm going to go down to Boxcar Coffee. Anybody know where that is over in Chipley? Yeah. And I get in there and they close at 1 and I walk in at 12.50. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, yeah, uh, sorry, dude, I'm going to get out of here. And the man named Michael is there working. He says, you know what? You just need to use the internet. I'm going to be cleaning up. Uh, I'll be here until 1.30 anyways. And as we're sitting there, it's just me and him. And so for some reason, I usually stick to myself. I'm like, whatever, I'm just going to do whatever I'm doing and go. And I just like, you know what, let me talk to this guy. And one thing led to another. And I can tell you, at 3 o'clock when I finally left that place... <laughs> After me and him talking, I found out that he was 34 years old. His parents are missionaries. He doesn't claim to be a Christian. But man, he heard me pour my heart out in him. And he told me that he has never had anybody present him the gospel the way I have. Wow. wow. How are your parents missionaries? Yeah. And nobody's presented you the gospel the way I have yeah. at 27. Age doesn't matter because you can sit in this church for years mm -hmm. and you can tell me the day you were saved. But can you tell me, have you grown since? No. There could be somebody in this room that's been a Christian for 25 years, but they've been reliving the first year 25 times in a row. This is not somebody you want as your Paul. Just because they appear to know what they're talking about doesn't mean they do. So what does that look like? That looks like somebody who comes in here with a PhD and they're flashing all their degrees, but they have a preschool grade knowledge in the Bible. You can look smart in the world, but if you don't know the word of God, you don't need to be a teacher. Because... As I'm looking at these percentages, what's happened is that all these people who have been in church for years but never grow are the ones trying to be a Paul. And so by the time it gets to the next generation and they have starting to start teaching, there's no biblical foundation. So those numbers don't really astound me anymore because people have stopped growing. You can't grow anything if you're dead. You know, I say all of this because Paul was this man before he met Jesus. If you read the history of the encounters with Jesus and the Pharisees, right, they can quote scripture at him, but they don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm listening to this book right now by um, Nashir something. He's a Pakistani man. He's a really great apologist. And an apologist is someone who goes and they defend the faith of Jesus. And I'm reading how the name of the book is Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. It's really, it's amazing. I'm like 12 chapters in. And um, he said that in the Muslim community, it's more important that you remember how to recite the verses than you know what they mean. And so based off that, it's no wonder why he found Jesus. Because he actually wanted to know what it meant, not just so that you can recite it. We've got too many people who can tell me Bible verses out of here, but no, have no idea how to live them out. Um, I'm horrible at remembering verses, by the way. Like, if you ask me, like, what's the name and verse and chapter, I can't tell you. But I can tell you what's in here. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you how what's in here has changed this. Amen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, Paul and Barnabas, when they were out on their journey, 
um, they didn't just let it in with them. As they ran across a young man, and his name was Timothy. Acts chapter 16 is where Timothy is introduced as Paul to Paul and Silas, and as they continue to spread the gospel. Timothy caught Paul's eye, and he invited Timothy to come along with him. <clears throat> you see, when I'm talking about a Timothy, I know we're eager. We want to grab just whoever we can and say, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. But in reality, you need to find someone who has what I would call the mark of Timothy. And what that looks like is that somebody who is humble, who is eager to learn about the ways of God, and is teachable. Has anybody ever heard you don't have a teachable spirit? Yeah. <laughs> you probably were humble at that time, right? Um, this is somebody who, who knows they're needing to grow. There's probably people in this church right now who are in a Timothy spot, but they don't know who to go for as their Paul. See, the mark of Timothy should not be ignored for just having the sake of a Timothy. So, as a youth pastor, I don't have favorites, obviously, but I can tell you there are youth that are right here by my side a lot of the times. And then there are youth that I'm trying to drag them out saying, come on, come do stuff with us. I'm not saying to give up on this one, but at the time, you have to focus on the ones who are hungry. Um, there's parents in this room, grandparents. You try to feed one of your kids. They're pushing everything away. And the other one's like, yeah, I'll take it. Let's go. Let's go. And so you don't neglect the hungry one because the one that doesn't want to eat. So the one that wants to eat is your Timothy. I just remember that without Pastor Ben pulling me in and walking with me day by day, because I know the church today, we like to do these big events. We're going to reach the community. And we bring in all these great numbers. And it's cool. Like, it's good. We need to do these things. But then our church still has the same people in it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Discipleship has to be a day in and day out choice. And as I'm ending, if you all stand with me. This process in a person's life should be a lifetime process. Don't look at yourself and say, I'm too old to be teaching. Don't look at yourself and say, I'm too young to be teaching. And if you're fresh in the faith, it doesn't matter what age you are. If you're saying, I'm a Timothy, find you a Paul. You know, I'm holding it together right now, but just as Jesus has passion for the Father's house, I do too. Um, I actually have a hard time drawing it back in, my emotion, whenever it comes to it, because I want to be about the Father's business just as Jesus is. Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them betrayed him. It's going to happen. But then they voted in someone else, and it kept growing. <laughs> I know this church loves Jesus. And I know this church is hungry to disciple. There are Pauls all in this room. We are Christians today, humanly speaking, because of those before us that were faithful in this process. So as, as I'm closing out, these are the questions that I want to leave you with consider for your week. The first question is this. Who 
Who is your Paul? And to who are you a Paul? Can you think of someone that you right now can pour into and walk day by day? And if you're a parent and grandparent, that one's easy for you. You've got kids and grandkids. Raise them up in the way of the Lord so they know the straight path. I love my parents. They didn't do that for me. And if you're asking yourself, well, how do I do that? You know what? Reading your Bible right in front of somebody sets an example. People are more likely to imitate what you do versus what you say. When my daughter grows up, that that beautiful little baby. (laughs) I hope she sees daddy worship. Amen. I hope she sees daddy praying. I hope she sees daddy in his work. And when she has questions, I hope daddy has the answers because he's been in there. Yeah, that's right. Yes, Lord. And I hope when she sees daddy interacting with his friends that she sees daddy's Barnabas. Which brings us to the next question. Who is your Barnabas? Who are you bouncing off with? Who's encouraging you? And as humans, we want that Barnabas, but the other flip side is who are you a Barnabas to? Who needs your encouragement today? We have a whole list of people that need encouragement. Man, I was just taken aback by how many prayer requests there are. Man, they need a Barnabas. Man, they need a Paul. Our final question. How was your Timothy? And just because you're a Paul, Paul still had people that he looked forward to, to talk to. See, he had Jesus straight up, though. He could imitate Jesus straight up. So, who are you a Timothy to? Just because I became a Paul doesn't mean I'm not still learning. I have to keep that humble, teachable spirit because I'm not writing everything. Until this body's gone, I'm messed up. If you close your eyes, will you? If you drew a blank on any of those questions, I want you right now to begin praying to God to bring someone in your life who will invest in you in each of these areas. If you need a Paul, pray for a Paul. If you need a Barnabas, pray for a Barnabas. If you need a Timothy, pray for a Timothy. And if you need to be a Paul, if you need to be a Barnabas, if you need to be a Timothy, right now we ask that. Jesus, open up our hearts, God. Let us be teachable again, God. These numbers are appalling and disgusting, God. We want to see dead bones rise again, Lord, as we saw earlier. Lord, but that that call, that command that you gave us, Jesus, to go out and make disciples, Lord, put that back on the church's heart and mind. Let our love for your word outweigh this world, God. You said that you would write your laws on our heart, God. But Lord, put it fresh in our mind every day, Lord. Lord, open our eyes to what we need to see. Open our mouths to when we need to speak, God. Lord, I know it's not about numbers. But in a way it is because we want to see heaven crowded. We want to see our church pews full. Renew our our strength, God. In Jesus' name, I pray.